What's going on, everyone? Welcome to Corner Table Talk, where we talk about things related to food plus drink plus culture. I am your host, Brad Johnson. My guest today requires no further introduction. I am so pleased to welcome the incomparable Billy D. Williams. Billy, welcome to Corner Table Talk. Thank you very much. Nice to have you. Nice to see you. Thank you. You have a wonderful face. Ah, thank you very much. It's lighting. Trust me, it's lighting, but I appreciate that. Before we get rolling, I wanted to thank a couple of people, Billy. Todd Gold, the journalist and author, has been a friend for years, and he was the first person I actually saw mention your book. I want to thank Todd for helping to arrange this, as well as Marcy Fine, who receives a glowing acknowledgement in, in your book that recently released, What Have We Here? Portraits of a Life which we're going to talk about a little bit today. I had the pleasure of listening to the audio version, and I have to recommend this highly. I, to read it, I'm sure, would is a journey as well, but to listen to it in, in Billy D's voice is just magical. Billy, I have a little thing I do called Short Order Questions. It's a restaurant uh, reference. I, I come out of the hospitality industry, so these are just a few little questions to get us rolling and uh, get us started. You ready to go? Yep. All right. So tell me, what music are you listening to these days? I listen to everything, from classical to the old pop stuff, the old uh, standards, to even some of the stuff that these young people are doing these days. Yeah, I, I heard you mention Childish Gambino when you were meeting with him over Star Wars, Donald Glover. Right. And I was surprised to hear that you you took the time to listen to his music. Oh, he's very good. I think he's very extremely, extraordinarily talented. Yeah, I love what he does. I would agree. You're also an extremely talented painter. Do you listen to music, Billy, when you paint? Yeah. Not always, but as a rule, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I'm, I also watch a lot of television when I'm painting. Really, that's unusual. Not a distraction. Listen, it's sort of whatever it is that I'm trying to express in the moment. So I'm originally from New York, but I lived in LA for 30 years. I, I loved when there's no traffic. Certain drives in LA. Do you have a favorite drive that you like in Los Angeles? Well, I haven't been doing it any. I don't do it anymore. But I used to love to take. Uh, long drives uh, up the uh, uh, Pacific Coast Highway. You know, yeah, I would yeah. would choose a uh, a weekend day and take these long drives. Yeah. How about a cocktail of choice? Is there something that you like to sip on a beverage when uh, the day is winding down? Well, recently came up with one. Uh, uh, it's a uh, a double a Tito's vodka in a wine glass with cucumber juice and ginger beer. Wow. It's pretty good. Okay. That sounds delicious. I love the ginger beer touch. Yeah, it adds just a little spice, you know, a little sharpness to it. Yeah, yeah. All right, so last one of these. How about your last great meal in a restaurant? I used to see you out occasionally at Le Petit Four and at Fred Siegel. I, I remember seeing you having lunch there, but anything come to mind? Well, don't say last great meal. <laughs> <laughs> Most recent great <laughs> meal. How's recent, that? A recent <laughs> meal. Well, you know, I like to go to there's several restaurants I frequent with my friends. One of them is uh, Le Petit Four, right there on Sunset. I love Escargo. So I love to have uh, Escargo in the afternoon with my uh, my special drink. Yeah, that's a, that's a great setting on Sunset. It kind of captures everything that's cool about LA. You get a little low key because you can tuck back you know, not only seen from the street, but you can see all the walk-by traffic, all the drive-by traffic. I, I love that room. Yeah, Sunset Plaza, right. That's what I was trying yep. to say, yeah. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's jump in here. How are you and where are you? Well, I'm at home now. It, looked, it looks lovely. You know, I want to reiterate, Billy, how much I enjoy the experience of, of listening to you narrate the chapters of what have we here. It really 
it struck me deeply. And, and throughout the book, you talk about your admiration for Duke Ellington. And uh, one of the times you happened to be in, a, in the dressing room that, that he was in and you thought about different things you wanted to say. And what you ended up saying was something that, that made me want to relate this to you. Uh, you said, watch him, learn from him, appreciate him and thank him. And I, that's what I wanted to say to you, Billy. I wanted to thank you because you've, you've elevated the bar for our culture. And I thank you for sharing your story uh, in, in this book. So I wanted to express that to you. That, that really resonated with me. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. My pleasure. You, you come across as always having been self-assured and aware of oh, really? the effect. <laughs> 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 I don't know about even all, now i don't know about all of that <laughs> e even now and you don't take yourself too seriously so that i go. definitely don't do <laughs> <laughs> you're modest and you're also astute and there was there's a, a place in the book where you talk about being on broadway and you're on stage and of course when you come out the ladies go crazy they're screaming and broadway's supposed to be somewhat subdued but uh, i guess when billy d makes an appearance that happens no matter where he is but uh, you notice a couple in one of the first couple of rows and the, the, they're having a hard time. The woman is apparently either paying too much attention to you and her and her husband seem to be having a difficult time. She was hyperventilating. Well, there you go. And you decided to direct the lines that you spoke in the play to the man. And that was a really interesting decision to make in that moment. And I'm curious, have you, have you felt your presence make other men uncomfortable or why in that moment did you make that decision? You know, I, yeah, I was playing Dr. King and uh, I wanted to take me seriously and I wanted uh, everybody to know that I was very serious about uh, giving a portrayal that was meaningful. So I decided to play the whole performance to this young man and he really appreciated it. What in his reaction told you that he was, that it was touching him? It was hitting home. I think he understood. He realized I wanted to make a point that uh, I was not there to take his girlfriend away from him. No. Have, have you found yourself in those kinds of situations, Billy, where you, you feel like you go out of your way to make the man more comfortable because of the attention that you get from women? I think so, yeah. Because I understand all of that kind of yeah. stuff. I remember once in Chicago, I was leaving a hotel and I got into my car and uh, this guy opened the door and threw his girlfriend in the car and said, there, you want to see him? There he is. I was like totally stunned, but I really felt sorry for him. I mean, I understand that kind of reaction, but because I don't take it, not that I don't really take it seriously, but I don't, I don't play off on it. Yeah, I, I was I was struck by your humility um, throughout the book. And again, the disarming part is you not taking yourself too seriously. I mean, clearly, you know, you descending the stairs and Lady Sings the Blues and that magical moment and the music. And, and it, I mean, it's it's one of those cinematic yeah. moments that just stays with you. And you talked about that moment in the premiere and how when you heard the audience erupt, these erupt, you just laughed. <laughs> you just thought it was hilarious. And I think that's cool. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, I mean, I said, my goodness gracious. Oh, <laughs> lovely. lovely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is this all about me? But I, uh, <laughs> I said, my good. I mean, they had with, uh, oh, what was her name? She was a beautiful girl. But. Nobody looked at her. Looking at you, they were looking man. at me. I thought that was yeah, that was hysterical. Yeah. But it was also the the moment when I presented Diana with the twenty dollar bill. It took me a while to do that scene because I was being treated in a, in the way that the old movie stars from the golden age of movies was being treated with special lighting and all that kind of stuff. And I just, I was in hysteric before I could pull myself <laughs> together. I was a little surprised to hear how instrumental uh, Barry Gordy was in a lot of the tone and 
importance of of portraying you the way that you were as a as a handsome dashing leading man uh but barry had a big hand in uh, both that and mahogany you know he's a product of of those movies of the uh, 50s he was quite instrumental in putting it all together the whole idea of creating memorable lines was something that was quite prevalent in the choice making putting yeah. that movie together. You know, like in Mahogany, what was it? What's the name, famous line? Love is nothing without someone you love to share it with. I mean, that's, that's right. an old adage. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, he was good at uh, finding those kinds of uh, the yeah. memorable dialogue. Yeah, that's what I, I find so culturally significant. And it makes perfect sense that Barry coming out of the world of music and songwriting where, you know, Smokey and those those phenomenal songwriters he was around, he would find the place in the right words at the right time to come, you know, and be part of black cinematic history. Um, and I and it, and it took a Barry Gordy and it took a obviously a Billy D. Williams to be able to deliver that line and impact people the way that you did. But it, it was significant that that. Uh, Barry knew the culture and was able to uh, put his finger on the pulse and deliver. Playing uh, Louis, Louis McKay in Lady Sings the Blues, I did a terrible audition. And, uh, and everybody in his team all wanted yeah. Paul yeah. Winfield who was to play the character. But he got real excited about me you know, being <laughs> at the chemistry that yeah. Diana I and I that. had with each other. It was like a, a major discovery. You know, he kept, he ran up to me, and he, he started, he says, Billy, he says, look, you're Louis McKay, you know, I just got to talk to these people, but you're Louis McKay. And I love that in, uh, in Barry, you know, he, yeah, he, he's like a mogul who's childlike, and it's beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing to watch. Yeah, it's childlike. What a great combination. Billy, I don't know how it was lost on me as a native New Yorker that you were born and raised in Harlem, but I didn't know that. I was surprised to see that. But then so much of your swerve um, is then it's kind of self-explanatory. Then it's like, oh, OK, I get it. My dad was a little bit older than you. He was born in 1925 and he made although he was born in Hartford, Connecticut, he grew up, really came into his own in New York in the 50s and 60s and through the 90s. And he owned a restaurant on 95th Street called The Cellar. I don't know if you ever went to The Cellar, but that was my dad's place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to, live, I used to go there all the time. Really? Oh, I love that. And although you were younger than my father, I can see... My, father's, my father was a huge Miles Davis fan. And before he bought the restaurant, he sold suits for Paul Stewart. He was actually the first black clothing salesman that worked in that fine department store of, of Paul Stewart's. You weren't, a, you weren't a member of the Jack and Jill, were you? I was not. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I was not. And neither was he. I know you mentioned that in your book. <laughs> you set a standard for black elegance that my father personified as well as a, as a restaurateur. And at points in the book, you talk about possibly being 30 years too soon, something along those lines. Was Hollywood intentionally not looking for opportunities for Billy D. Williams as a leading man? Could be. Was it, was it just, could they, what was, what was the issue? How could they not find the script that you say 40 years later you're, you're still waiting for? Well, I think they didn't know what to do with me. You know, I was something out of the uh, out of the ordinary. I, I presented a whole perspective and point of view that never really had that kind of uh, impact as far as being a, a romantic figure on the screen. But mm -hmm. and so they had no idea how to deal with that. They they came up with ideas, but never really uh, followed through with those ideas. So. I always say you win some, you lose some. Yeah, I, I love that even in your telling of it, there's no, there's no bitterness. I mean, you've had a fantastic life. What a journey. But it, it's also, it would be understandable if you would look back with a little bit of, what were you guys thinking? But I don't, I don't detect any bitterness, Billy, from you at all. Well, I mean, listen, I'm not going to spend my life and my energy being pissed off. 
You know, it is what it is. But I mean, I even had uh, black executives decide that uh, what I was presenting was not black enough. So you mm. you get it from both sides. Mm. You know? That's interesting. <laughs> Which I That's always I always find uh, really amusing. Yeah. Yeah. My mom and dad were married in the early fifties. My mom was Italian. And, you know, you, you talk about interracial relationships in the book and, you know, I'm a product of one when interracial marriage was, was illegal, you know, in, in most states and that not black enough, I, I can relate to that <laughs> from sure, both sides. I'm sure you can. <laughs> yeah. People look, they're like, what are you? you know, that was my least favorite question <laughs> growing up, still is. <laughs> I had a strong, strong relationship with my dad and followed in his footsteps professionally into the restaurant business. And I was really touched, Billy, by the closeness that you express to your whole family, your mom, your dad, your sister, lady, your grandmother, but in particular, Hanako and Corey. And following in the footsteps of an icon has got to be a difficult path. And I, and I wonder if you were ever concerned that the journey for Corey might be tough. No, no. I, you know, I've always encouraged uh, uh, Corey. Corey, he was my very first best friend. And uh, we still remain uh, best friends. Um, no, I, I always made sure that Corey felt secure within himself. I always encouraged him. No matter what he decided to do, I was always 100% behind him and uh, always pushing. I wanted him to always be cognizant of his what he's able to, to present mm -hmm. to the world. And uh, so I was a, I've always been a, a, a real support to Corey. But I'm like that with all my... With my kids, I mean, they don't, I don't, you know, I'm just daddy, you know, and uh, and and we're all good buddies, and we love having great discussions with each other, you know. So that's pretty much the way we interact with each other. Yeah, that that's so rich. You know, there was one scene, one scene, one uh, chapter in the book. It might have been the mahogany premiere where or lady sings the blues i don't I, I think it was mahogany where you talk about having bought Corey a uh, a brown velvet suit he looked like a movie star oh, yeah. at the premiere <laughs> and i just i just love that you take the attention off yourself and you you share the spotlight in such a gracious way that really that really touched me you know i, I he's he was such a beautiful little boy you know and uh in, in, a, in a way he was like a uh had like having a nice little doll to play with, you know, <laughs> dress up. In the, not, I, I know that sounds a little bit peculiar, but no, but I, I, I always, for me, Corey was just a beautiful little boy. I mean, I, it, it was a, that, a, a moment in my life when I thought that I would never ever want another child. I mean, he was like, the best thing that ever happened to me before he was uh, born, when I knew that he was, uh, uh, my wife was pregnant at the time, my first wife, Hurricane Audrey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I said, I kept saying my, my best friend is coming. And I, and I was really, I was only 22 years old, 23, but I, I really looked forward to his uh, entering the uh, the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, that comes through in such a, a really warm way. You also talk a lot about your dad, and again, as a, the proud son, uh, you know that I that I am of my dad and what he was able to do. Uh, that relationship is, uh, you know, it, it's so meaningful to me. And you talk about your dad as a hero in real life, and uh, he worked maintenance and custodial work. And you said, quote, the most important lesson in my life, um, I experienced how hard my father worked. You went to work for him one day in, in place of him and you did his job and you saw how hard he worked and went on to say to work hard physically without complaints 
a man of great character and unconquerable soul. He taught me about humility, about devotion. He taught me about love. And Billy, you know, we're in a culture where we hear so much about toxic masculinity and the black father not being around, but we both come from, you know, strong father led households. Well, your mom had a big influence too, but I'm, I'm talking specifically here about the, the father son bond. If you would just expand on that a little bit and the importance of fatherhood and sharing with your son the way that you have. Daddy was, uh, he was, uh, he was from uh, Texas. He was a big old country boy. And, <laughs> but the loveliest, sweetest, most wonderful human being. People loved him. And cause he never, uh, he was never put, he never put on airs. You know, he was uh, always a very simple man man who didn't mind spending those long hours working to make sure everybody was okay. And he would always devote, you know, at least one day during the weekend, on the weekend, to all of us going out and doing something like picnics, uh, we'd go to Palisades Park, we'd go on, uh, to the beach you know, Jones Beach or Orchard Beach. I mean, and also he devoted, he did, he loved cooking. So he would uh, take one of uh, a day and cook ham, turkey, beef, all of this stuff. Uh, and, and, it, and if you, and it, if you came to the house, you had to eat and you know, and, and, and if, if before you left the house uh, as a guest, he would kiss you on the on the forehead. Daddy was, uh, listen, when he was passing away from, because uh, uh, he had leukemia, um, I was in California. And he waited for me to go back, or, uh, fly back to uh, New York City, where he was at, at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. And he was surrounded by all of the people that loved him, all of the people that he loved. And he was telling jokes as he was dying, uh, his corny jokes. Um, he, I remember one moment, beautiful moment, when he took my mother's hand and he held her hand and he said, well, what's my little girl going to do without me? Mm. And uh, that was one of the most beautiful moments that I have ever experienced between uh, two people. But Daddy... Daddy, you know, when I took his jobs that summer, because he went and bought himself a, you know, he never, he never bought anything on time. If he, if he couldn't afford it, he didn't buy it. But he saved up enough money to buy himself a um, 1956 Buick Special. And he hadn't seen his mother in 20 years. So he drove down to Texas in his car. But I stayed back and took on a couple of jobs that he did, maintenance jobs. And it was probably the best thing uh, that ever happened to me. Because as, I, as you alluded to, it really made me realize a real sense of commitment, a real sense of love and commitment. Mm -hmm. And put himself, put himself through in order to keep his family together. So that was a great lesson for me. I think that kind of lesson creates a kind of a humility or an, an awareness 
of, of a kind of humility. Yeah. No matter what you achieve in life, it seemed to me, no matter what I would achieve in life, uh, it's, it was, it, it humbled me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, hey, I can see how it would be grounding that, that kind of experience. And a couple things there, Billy, I wanted to go back and touch on, you know, one, uh, your, where your dad, Pat, I was born at Mount Sinai hospital. And, um, it's funny. My parents, as I, my mom was Italian, her maiden name was Philomena Martha Noter Angelo. And because my dad was afraid that they could get arrested, you know, when they, when they traveled outside of New York, filled in my birth certificate for my mom as Negro. And <laughs> I didn't realize that it was actually my father that had done that. But, um, so, you know, my father, would, so he was, I know, I know he was from a different generation. And, you know, you mentioned the kiss on the forehead of your dad. And as much as I love my dad and we had many great conversations and talks, the most we ever did was was shake hands. It was never maybe we hugged one time. It was kind of like a, a light hug. But this on the forehead, I wanted to come back to that because in, in the book you share a uh, a moment when you went to visit he, he um, the lady. He, he also give you a, a plunk on the head. That was, that was, uh, <laughs> a little less pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you went to visit uh, the late, great Roscoe Lee Brown uh, in his final days at Cedar sinai I was also very close with, with Roscoe and visited him as well uh, during his final days at Cedars. And uh, Roscoe gave me a line, Billy, that uh, has stayed with me. I think he might have seen me come in my dad's restaurant at one point, maybe a little too full of myself. And he pulled me aside, and it's become my mantra in the hospitality business. He said, young man. Never mistake your arrival for the event. <laughs> and man, that, that stayed with me. But yeah, I wanted to. Yeah, a yeah, great voice. Great voice. I wanted to, you know, what, I'm, what I guess I'm trying to convey here is that there's, an, there's importance here in the continuum of black man to generationally to young black men. And the stories like your stories um, I'm so grateful that you've told yours because I feel like there's so many from a generation that have not been told and have not been told fully. And to have heard it in your words is just magnificent. And I just I hope that you that you appreciate the value that uh, hearing the story in your words uh, offers to a generation of younger black men like myself. Yeah, listen, it helps. Great. You know, fantastic. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's all about wonderful individuals. I, mean, I don't really, I tend not to gauge everything based on um, on the question of blackness, or what's a good black man, as opposed to a, a black man who's not a good father or whatever. Individual, I'm I'm from that era. Uh, of individualism, uh, which I have a real appreciation for, and um, I tend to uh, look at things uh, pretty much based around that per perspective. But... Yeah. Okay. No, um, listen. Um, if mm -hmm. what if if it works, if it, if I'm uh, giving some piece of info information that can be used you know I listen great fantastic but um, I'm a, I tend to look at life I guess pretty much based around I guess like when Tesla talks about frequency energy uh, vibration uh, it's a kind of a universal kind of experience. It was experience of the universe. You know, when I pray, I pray to create creative energy in this life and beyond this life. Um, because I think that we're just an extension of something, a continuum, continuum. Um, 
I'm still, even at this stage in my life, before I step out of here, I want to, you know, my, my sister and my mother were Jehovah Witness. They had an idea where they were going to go. I'm still figuring, trying to figure out, I'm trying to still trying to figure out something. And I hope before I have that moment that uh, there's some part of me that knows where I'm going, whatever the hell I'm trying to say here. No, I, 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 I'm following you. I think, you know, you talk about that in the book. I think at one of your art exhibits, someone asked you about religion and, you know, if you believed in afterlife or, or whatever the, the, the question was. And your answer was along the lines of, of what you just said. And I think you use the expression, the eye of God, but you don't see God as an individual. Um, but there, there's, a, well, there's I, something out there. Yeah, in the I don't use the word God. I think that's uh, all politics. Whatever the experience is, for me, is much bigger and much broader um, than just sort of locking into uh, this kind of a, a temporal, uh, myopic uh, vision of that that kind of energy. It's a the energy is is incredible whatever it is but I know that as long as I have breath I'm going to try to the brain is like a library for me uh, I'm going to try to do all of the things necessary Oh boy, I hate getting into these kind of discussions. But anyway, I want to do the, I want to do the good things. I want to be I want to oh, instead of doing this, I want to oh I want to go through life doing this. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's I want to finish with this. Mm hmm. The, Softly. The conscious self. Mm -hmm. Just just going back just for a second to the role model, that, if you don't mind that terminology, you know, just as you missed, Billy, the, the, the roles that could have been for you as a black leading man, you talked about in the book, you know, where was our Ferris Bueller's day off? Where were, you know, so many of the stories and the, and the nuances to our lives that, that could have been portrayed to not have seen those um, examples on the screen, I think left a big vacancy for black America. And so, you know, you represented something, you represented this elegance, this cool. I mean, if, if any one of us put on a new suit one day or would lean in too far in our car, I'd be like, Oh, so what are you Billy D today? You know, it's like you, you were this, this, this thing to us that we, that raised the bar, that raised the standards. So I, I just wanted to make a point there that I get the, the removing of the color, um, you know, identification of race as a, any kind of a barrier or a restriction, but specifically for us, Billy, you were somebody that, you know, we saw ourselves in and who we wanted to be. So I, I just wanted to make that point a little bit clearer. Well, I appreciate that. However, I see myself as a, a walking absurdity. <laughs> <laughs> walking talking. You know, it's very, it's very interesting. When I started really getting into my painting, uh, there were, I started out with, uh, I consider my painting self-portraits no matter what, whatever I'm talking about. But I started out by painting a, about this myself as a, a journeying through life. And the first, one of the first paintings I did after I came back from New York from doing fences, uh, I remember was a painting that I still, I still have the painting. It's stored away. It's called From A to Z and Beyond. 
but it's a, I always saw myself as this kind of a, I love romance. I always saw myself as a, a kind of a, well, he, he ends up become what I call the bon vivant. Uh, but a guy who's just with a staff in his hand, journeying through life, going through, I guess, obfuscation. It's like journeying into areas that you can't figure out. So I, I have always, and then finally I ended up, the first paintings were me in a, uh, walking through this storm with a staff in my hand and journeying to find out where I was going to go, you know, through all of these portals. Um, I ended up with him being a, a bon vivant, you know, w walking with his cane, you know, observing things as they exist and the absurdity of things. So, anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there. I'm still trying to figure it out, but I, yeah. I want to do it with a certain kind of elegance. Because I, I love elegance. I'm from that school. Well, that school. well, dare I say you are accomplishing that uh, <laughs> as we speak. Um, a, a couple things more, Billy, just before I, I let you go. I wanted to touch on friendship because you said something interesting uh, relative to James Baldwin. And you and him had developed a, a relationship uh, very early on and talked about a, a time you went, took him to your tailor and you uh he got a, a new suit tailor made and the the broad grin on his face we can all picture that that smile on baldwin's face <laughs> and uh of course you tried to develop the malcolm x story with him and you know that that uh, never came to be unfortunately for for all of us who would have loved to have seen that um but the the scene that struck me the most was when you were reacquainted with 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 baldwin after lady sings the blues and you you talk about having grown up yourself and that the relationship had shifted. You were no longer the same. And I got the sense that the friendship, although there were still warm feelings there, the friendship wasn't what it was. And I'm and I'm curious about, I mean, I've heard it said that, you know, some friends are for a season. Um, do you feel that way that, that in, there's such a thing as like seasonal friendship where people are supposed to be in your lives for a certain period of time and then, you know, you go one way, they go the other. Well, yeah, I think that happens. You know, uh, we were always friends, and we would always remain friends. It's just that uh, I, I had a particular need to take a particular kind of direction, as opposed to um, Jimmy was a warrior. You know, Jimmy was uh, he was he was battling. I'm not a person that likes to battle. Uh, but it's it somehow battling for him fed him. It was beautiful to watch. And it was beautiful to listen to. I think I was a little bit more commercial minded. I was looking to be a successful artist. It was the ambition was there were two different kinds of ambition. His was probably much more admirable than what I was searching for. I was searching to be one of the great actors in America and things of that nature. I wanted, I wanted to be a, a recognized painter. Yeah, that's pretty much it. It's like a marriage, right? You know, sometimes marriages go on forever and then sometimes people just grow away from each other you use the expression that you were not recruitable and i know that you know it was a time obviously the 60s were turbulent in some <laughs> of the 70s and that you know folks tried to get billy d to to join their cause but you said you were not recruitable i i thought that was a, a real indication of of knowing who you are knowing who you were well i tried it you know it didn't work i always found that uh whenever you join groups Everybody wants to be chief, uh, you know, the boss. 
and I can't live in that kind of atmosphere. I, I'm, a, I'm first of all, I'm really a loner. As I said, I'm an individual. And so I live by the ideas based on, on that. You're in your 80s now, Billy, and you still are strikingly handsome, uh, debonair, well-dressed. You know, we're told to take kindly the counsel of the years and gracefully surrender the things of youth. And I'm, I'm wondering with so much emphasis on physical beauty these days, aging for men can present its challenges. And for someone who has represented a certain physical aesthetic as you have, how do you view the process of accepting what comes with age? I don't know. <laughs> this is just going to age no matter what. Uh, the process, I mean, I don't, don't know if I have any control over that. I mean, I try to take as good care of myself. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that, really. I mean, I just try to do all of the things that keep good thoughts, surround myself with people that uh, I care about and who care about me. You just take it from... Uh, moment to moment, the day by day, and see where it all uh, leads to. Um, mm -hmm. I'm still very much excited about life, and you know, and I think as long as you have that, I'm still childlike in that sense. I mean, I will never give up wanting to know and wanting to listen. In closing here, I'd, I'd savored the book like a like a great meal that you want to take a piece of bread and just, you know, sop up the, the gravy, you know, even at the end. And as I, as I said to you, it just it stayed with me after. And you said towards the end, there were a lot of a lot of really great quotes. And I don't want to give them away because I want to encourage people to listen to it or read it for themselves. But, you know, something you said that was very simple. Billy, but I thought uh, just like you, elegant and, and impactful, you said, quote, don't worry so much. Stay positive. Move forward. Enjoy life. It's a gift. An astonishing, beautiful, absurd gift. Be kind and be curious. And then my favorite part, chandelier, baby. <laughs> chandelier. <laughs> oh, that was great. That was great. Well, thank you, Billy, for uh, for taking some time today, man. I, I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to meet you, and uh, much respect for you, sir. It's a pleasure meeting you, and stay well. Chandelier, baby. <laughs> <laughs>